So welcome to the, the first ever episode of the Two Degree Cycling Show. Uh, Jake Stewart, welcome, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. No, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always nice to to get on and uh, talk about cycling. So, yeah. Definitely. And it just, you just think if you never win anything this year, you'll have the honour of being the first first person on the uh, the Two Degree Cycling Show. So you can well, retire I, happy, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, still chasing that first win anyway. So. Um, yeah, at least if I've got a win this season, then it makes it a bit easier when it comes to our season. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, you've not got a win, but let's talk before we we talk about your journey. Let's talk about your performance uh, in France recently at the Etoile de Bessage, uh, fourth overall, young rider classification jersey winner, um, and that incredible tenth on the final stage in the time trial. I think, were you surprised as anyone that you put in such a good performance on the TT? Yeah, I, yeah, it definitely came as a surprise. Even even fourth in GC came as a surprise, but yeah, that final day in the TT was, uh, yeah, I don't think anyone was really expecting it. It's always been, uh, it's always been my Achilles heel, the, the time trial, and it's always kind of been my downfall when it's been in, uh, in like, even junior and into 23 races, if it was coming down to a TT and I was still in a good position in GC, then, you know, I'd always lose it uh, in the time trial. So, yeah, I mean, pulling out a, uh, a TT like that with uh, the kind of company that I was in was, uh, yeah, big surprise. But, I mean, good kit is what I'm putting it down to with the team. And, uh, yeah, it kind of proves if your head's in the right place, uh, sorry, if your legs are in the right place, if your legs are good and your head's in the right place, then pretty much anything's possible. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that whole kind of that whole stage race seems to go your way, didn't it? I mean, like you said, there was some pretty phenomenal uh, talent in there, and to to finish fourth overall, um, you know, in your first race, I guess, with the uh, the team properly at World Tour, that must have been beyond your wildest dreams. What were your kind of ambitions going into that race? Yeah, I think. Um, well, I mean, it's like a point one race, and it was basically World Tour like world tour field uh, that was there um so yeah i didn't really have much expectations going into it i hadn't been out on a training camp over the winter or anything so like i'd spent the winter in the uk i hadn't had any of the warm weather and whatnot because of uh, covid restrictions and all that so like it was kind of it was a bit in the dark where where my condition was at and how good i was going to be going um so it's kind of like we'll go to Bessage in marseille and uh yeah do a job for the team and, and see what happens there but kind of yeah, it was all pretty much together the first two days and then that third day when the big split went up the road, which never came back. And then I was in that and then kind of that set up GC from there. Um, and then, yeah, it was just kind of focusing on riding for a good GC result and uh, trying to get up there in the sprints and whatnot. So. Yeah, and you must be you must be you know nicely settled at, uh, at FDJ now. You've you've been there um, in the development squad for the last couple of years, but then you you kind of was elevated to the World Tour squad after the restart last year. Um, what what how have you found that step up from the Conti team to the uh, the World Tour team? Yeah, I think um, it's I, I kind of took it in my stride. I think um, I think well, I think I've proven that you know, over at Bessage anyway, like getting a result like that um, anyway, but it's kind of, it's felt like it's been a long time coming kind of thing. Um, you know, I've been, I've always been there or thereabouts with the under 23s. I've always had good results, even from my first year as an under 23, but like, I've always missed that win. Um, and, you know, was kind of chasing it last year and I th thought it was going to come, uh, especially right at the start of the year, you know, we did last in the end and couple of races, Algarve with the World Tour team and I was feeling really good and, you know, I was, I was set for a good season, really wanted to focus on them, them in 23 classics, Flanders, Ghent. Uh, yeah, and try and, like, take a win there and it kind of, once COVID hit, it disrupted the whole season anyway. Um, and then I came out of it really motivated, went to Limousin with the World Tour team, second on GC. And, you know, that was just, I was second on GC by, like, two seconds. So that was bittersweet, you know, because it was it was possible. And when I look back at the last stage, I kind of rode it. I rode to defend second rather than rode to try and win and chucked away second kind of thing. And I, I kind of regret that. But um, yeah, just kind of chasing that win, I think, is uh, is what's still in the back of my mind as an under-23. You know, I'm still an under-23 now, so I don't know if Wells possibly ride under-23s this year, but... Um, 
yeah, I think my step up from Conti team to the World Tour team has been pretty smooth and with the support of the team from the Conti team to the World Tour team anyway, it's been really good anyway. And, and what's it been like on um, Francis de Jure for the last couple of years? I mean, they they are known as, you know, a very French team. We'll, we'll perhaps chat about Marc Madio um, as we get further in. But they are, you know, they are the archetypical kind of French team. I know the, the Conti team had quite a lot of nationalities, but I, I guess for you, it's almost like the perfect, the perfect introduction to continental racing. They are probably one of the most continental teams, aren't they? Yeah, I think... For me, it's certainly been like the best stepping stone that I could have had to uh, to move from you know under twenty three to to elite and go from under twenty three to world tour. I think that the you know when uh, so I, the first year that I was on the continental team was the was the first year the team was in existence, um, and I was approached by the team and I was on the Great Britain Senior Academy at the time and kind of like considering making that move and a lot of people questioned me um, and a lot of people didn't think it was the right environment for me to be in they didn't think that i'd get anywhere it was good opportunities that i was getting with gb as i would be with fdj um, and yeah a lot of people just kind of put question marks over it and in the end you know i realized that i didn't really want to focus on the track so there wasn't really much point in me staying with the with the gb setup uh, and in the long term i wanted to focus on the road anyway so for me the logical step seems like to go to a World Tour development team, do two, three years with the World Tour development team and step up to the World Tour. Um, and that's kind of what, what I wanted to do um, when I signed there. So, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, for, for me, the kind of bike rider I am, you know, where my head's at, where, you know, my, uh, how I live and whatnot, it, it suited me, suited me fine. And, uh, yeah, I don't think I could have thought of a better stepping stone to move from, you know the British bubble into you know a uh, a multi multi uh, national kind of team, and then to step up into the World Tour. I think if I if I was still on there, if I'd stayed on the Great Britain development team, I would still be there now probably. So yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the the decision to step away from. The, the the senior academy. I mean, I, I think Adam Yates did something similar. I think he decided that he was, you know, probably not going to, you know, focus on the track, and it, you know, seems to have worked out all right for for Adam. But what was it about the track? Because you got some results on the track, didn't you, as a junior and and kind of earlier in your career? What was it about the track that kind of just didn't appeal, perhaps, as much as the road? Yeah, um, I've always enjoyed the track racing, but it, I've always been. I've always enjoyed the bunch racing more than the, the team pursuit and the individual pursuit. And obviously the Olympics focus and the GB focus is predominantly around the, around the team pursuit. I know that's shifting now, but, you know, I always enjoyed the Madison that was, you know, where my heart was at on the track. Um, and yeah, I got some good results, you know, at the Worlds and also the, the Europeans as a, as a junior. Uh, yeah, as a junior on the, on the track in the Madison points race. And bench racing and you know i never really i was never really in that in that team pursuit team until i was a you know final year junior and even so then it wasn't as if i was you know one of the strongest in the team pursuit team so kind of i just looked at it like that and you know i wanted to focus if i was going to stay on the track i wanted to focus on madison and points racing um but that wasn't really an option moving on to the senior academy and it was more track focused in the winter and then road focused in the road season obviously but you know i was wanting to put in a good a good winter on the road to be good for the road season rather than doing a good winter on the track to be good for the track and then get into the road season and you know lagging behind a bit so yeah that's certainly like um you know i did enjoy the track but i didn't really see myself fighting for an olympic spot in the future four years five years time so it kind of just felt to me like it was just a couple of years wasted and if I could focus on the road now and move World Tour sooner then you know it's, it sets me up better for, for my career. And what was it like that move to France that kind of first year is is it the first time you'd lived away from home I guess you know for a prolonged period and how much did you spend in France what what kind of uh, were you there for the whole block of race in the whole summer or were you kind of back and forth from from France to the UK? Yeah it was um so with the GB team, I'd lived away from home anyway. So I'd moved out of my parents' house when I was 18, moved up to Manchester. And then we did basically October to 
January in Manchester and then February, March, beginning of April in Italy and then um, May in the, over that classics period in Belgium. And then we came back to the UK, um, to Manchester, uh, probably just before road nationals. So like June, July time. And then we spent most of the time back in the UK from there. So like I'd already lived away from home and I'd already got a feel for living away from home. And obviously living in the UK away from home is different from living abroad because you're in your own country and it's your own you know, lifestyle. So obviously the shift to France was just adjusting to the lifestyle and the language. And that's always going to be a barrier when you're first moving, moving countries anyway. Um, but, you know, I just kind of knuckled down and got stuck in and just realised that if, if I'm not going to put in the effort, then there's no point in me trying to enjoy it out here. You know, you've got to, you've got to enjoy it to be a good bike rider. And then, yeah, so it was all, it was all interlinked, basically. And you were supported by the, the Dave Rayner Fund, been supported for a couple of years by the Dave Rayner Fund. How how important was that? Not just perhaps in terms of the kind of the financial support, but also the, the kind of wider support being part of something that's been massive, you know, helped launch the career of so many of the, the stars of British cycling that we've we've seen over the last two decades. Yeah, it's kind of, because um, when I left the GB programme, I was like uh, being coached by Keith Lambert, who's obviously has a big role in the Dave Rayner Fund anyway. So um, he approached me once I'd left uh, the British Cycling Programme and said, look, we want to help support you moving to France and whatnot. And I said, yeah, I'd love that. It'd be really good. So I applied for the Dave Rayner Fund. They gave me some financial support and all that. But I think more than anything, it's just the uh, just having the, the brains around you. You know, Joss and Tim, they've lived out in Belgium for however many years. You know, they know the crack in, in Belgium and all that. And... Uh, yeah, it's just having having that support network, it makes it a bit easier because obviously moving to France, you're on a French team, you're surrounded by French support staff. It's just nice to have a support network around you that's English speaking and British and yeah, it's, um, it makes a big difference. And I guess with uh, with Tim's racing background, I hear lots of tales about Tim and kind of some of the, the kind of training runs he, he takes riders on. I think you stayed at... Uh, Tim and Josh South, didn't you? Did you did you get a chance to test yourself against Tim and his legs? No, so I was for, I only stayed at Tim and Josh's house with a couple of the lads when I was doing a block in Belgium. So I'd flown out to Belgium just before the the classics. Um, now I was doing the national team, so I'd flown out from France to Belgium with the national team, um, and I think I'd stayed at Tim and Josh's. I think it was two nights just before we moved to the hotel with the national team, uh, and in that I had an easy day a day off the bike, I think it was, and then just an easy activation ride. So I didn't even, you know, get out with Tim and whatnot. So yeah, he was, um, I, you know, you, everyone's heard the tales. So it was, uh, yeah, I didn't get out with him, but everyone's heard it. So. Um, and this weekend, let's look ahead to this weekend. You've got the double header opening weekend. Obviously, it's not your first taste of the, the Belgian cobbles. You did well in the, in the junior races, a couple of podiums there. Plus, as you were mentioning earlier, the kind of the start last year with uh, Get Webel German, Tour of Flanders and Shell the Price and things like that. What are you expecting this weekend? I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sat here and the weather and the wind is howling against the wind and the rain. It's almost typically Belgian weather. What are you expecting from from, from opening weekend? I guess you'll, you'll be excited to, to get back out to Belgium, will you? Yeah, I'm just excited to get stuck in, you know. It's, um, so it'll be my first World Tour race of this year. I did Flanders in Ghent last year, but, you know, it'll be my first World Tour race this year. Um, I know that my, my level's good. I'm in good condition at the moment. Um, I'm feeling decent on the bike. So it's just kind of get stuck in and get out there. And, uh, you know, more than anything this year, it's learning experience for me uh, as a young rider still. You know, it's my first classics campaign. Um, it's just a learning experience to move forward and, and help the boys in the future. But, yeah, certainly this weekend it will... Uh, It'll all be for Demar and uh, and Kung, so uh, yeah, be getting stuck in helping them boys doing a job, and uh, probably won't make it to the finish, but <laughs> we'll see. And what's it like riding with the likes of Arna Demar and, and and Stefan Kung? You know, they these guys are you know multiple kind of national champions and 
you know, Armand especially had a, a fantastic restart last year. What, what are you looking to learn? Is it that kind of race craft? Is it the, you know, just the, the, the staying power in these races? Is it the positioning? What, what, will, what will you learn from, from riding with these boys? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've got, I've, obviously I've got race craft from under 23s and juniors and earlier in my career. So it's not necessarily the race craft because, you know, once you step up to the world tour, usually you're, you're a bike rider that's winning winning races or, you know, close to winning races. So you, you know that race craft. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily race craft, but it's just the learning experience of the classics. You know, classics is such a special, a special race and, uh, you know, it's different to anything, any other race that you'll, you'll ride through the season and each one's got its own characteristics and, you know, each one's different. And uh, it's just kind of, you know, building, building your knowledge of the races and, you know, um, positioning and all these boys that have done, you know, classics, classics campaigns for the last five, six, seven years, they know the roads like the back of their hands. They know when they need to move up. They know when there's going to be wind. They know, and, you know, that's, that's what makes the difference when it comes to trying to win the races you know, they know when they need, to, where they need to be, when they need to be there. You know, they know the wind is probably going to be coming from this direction because it has been for the last five years kind of thing. And, you know, that's what makes a difference when it comes to, to winning the classics. So it's just kind of, um, yeah, it's just like learning, learning the roads, learning the classics campaign. And, uh, you know, there's plenty, plenty you can learn as a, as a British rider in echelons and crosswinds and whatnot, because obviously we don't get so much of that in the UK and, and on the on the continent because most of us are racing in France and Spain and Italy rather than Belgium and uh, and the Netherlands. So yeah, certainly in that sense, that kind of craft and just learning learning the trade almost for the classics because it is just such a different different. Right, it's a different like beast altogether. Isn't it? Yeah, certainly. And we, we mentioned Mark Maddio at the start. I mean, there's some incredible clips of him kind of offering his let's say unique. Uh, encouragement for uh, Tibor Pino lent out a car windows. Um, have you experienced the uh, the, the Madio encouragement yet? Even on training rides, is he is he as as mad on training rides in the car as he is perhaps on uh, at Grand Tours? No, I, th I think yeah, I think he reserves that for for the races. Um, you know, in training camps and whatnot, when he's out with his boys in training, and uh, you know, he's always pretty chilled. He's a pretty cool character, and uh, yeah, he's. Um, yeah, he's just a cool character, you know. He's every, everyone knows the face, everyone knows the personality, and uh, he's just a cool guy. But yeah, once he's once he's in the races, you know, it's like he's racing again. Um, the only race that I've done with him was last year at uh, Dipan, and uh, he was driving the car, and we had the DS in the in in the passenger seat, but Mark was driving, and uh, he was popping uh, caffeine gels just before the start of the race. So you know, he he, he was getting into the mentality. Of, you know, as if he's back on the bike and, you know, he's getting stuck into the racing. And, yeah, he's, uh, he's such a passionate guy. And, you know, you can really see that he loves the sport. He loves cycling. He loves Group Palmer FDJ. And, uh, yeah, he just, I think it's a mixture of emotions and everything. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, when you see it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something special. And uh, it shows you why people love this sport and how you can love the sport. Absolutely. Well, we wish you all the very best uh, this weekend. Uh, I'm sure, uh, like you say, you'll get plenty out of it. And uh, and with a bit of luck, the weather might be slightly better than it is in uh, in the UK. But uh, we wish you all the best. We'll uh, we'll get you back on the show, I guess, uh, before the end of the season as well. But uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to go on the Two Degree Cycling Show. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure.